webinar started and we are live. Thank you very much. We'll let the, a lot of people come in here. We're, whoop, we're 75, let me make sure I'm muted here. I'm not getting too much feedback. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, this is the Seneca Valley School District School Board uh, work session. And uh, I'm going to call this meeting to order tap of the gavel, but I'm gonna have a little bit of help. Uh, we have another special guest with us this evening uh, and it's Nate Bosha. And Nate's gonna help me out here with the tap of the gavel to call our meeting to order. So Nate, if you'd come over, please. What I need you to do is just give me three real good taps. Bang, bang, bang. Okay. Thank you very much, Nate. Wow. And with that tap of the gavel, um, I will call the San Valley School District School Board work session of January 11, uh, 2021 to order. And to begin, uh, I'd like to begin with a moment of silence. Uh, and in this moment of silence, we'd like it to be in memory of those who died and in recognition of the many who were injured during last week's violence at the United States Capitol in Washington, DC. And also in memory of Jason Worley, who served the Seneca Valley School Board for nearly six years from 2008 to 2013. In 2014, Mr. Worley was appointed to the Seneca Valley Board of Trustees and was a current and active member during the time of his passing. He was an incredibly committed and supportive presence in our district, and Mr. Worley was at the Seneca Valley Administration offices as recently as December 14th when he dropped off gifts for our holiday wish program to benefit SV students in need, and he will be deeply missed. So I'd ask everyone to join me in a moment of silence. Thank you very much. Uh, I would also like to mention that the district in partnership with the Seneca Valley Foundation is in the planning stages to develop a memorial event and or scholarship in the memory of Mr. Worley and more information will be announced in the future meeting once these details are finalized. I know that uh, I served with uh, Mr. Worley for a number of years uh, as did a few of the other board members. So prior to us having that memorial, if there's any other board members that would uh, like to say a word in his memory, I would. Uh, I'll offer them the opportunity now. Uh, Mr. Nickel? Yeah, I, I would just like to take a moment. I, and by way of just a, a brief story, when I first met Jason as a member of the board, uh, candidly, we were on different sides of a lot of issues. And, uh, you know, I reached out to Jason and, and we came together. We sort of reached across the aisle, literally and, and figuratively, and, uh, and really saw where each of us was coming from on those issues. And uh, I just, I wanna applaud him and remember him for someone who was willing to find a way to, to come together and form a relationship that was the basis for a lot of great things uh, that uh, have come to pass at Seneca Valley. So when I heard the news of his passing, I was really uh, emotional and uh, he was a, a great man. Um, and he is, as uh, Mr. Dutilio said, uh, will be sorely missed. I miss him a lot. I think, is there any other board members that did serve or had any other words that they would like to express? Um, I, I will say, you know, I'll echo a lot of what Mr. Nichols said. Uh, when I first started on the board, uh, Mr. Worley and I were not on, you know, always in agreement on things. However, he was uh, an attorney by trade, uh, a very good one from, from everything that I've ever gathered. Uh, and he brought that sense uh, of being a, an attorney, but he was like no attorney that I'd ever met. Um, he did understand and have compassion. And uh, as Mr. Nicholas said on many occasions, you know, we were and still are a board of um, you know, a, a lot of different backgrounds, um, butchers, bakers, candlestick makers. And, and Mr. Worley brought that, uh, that lawyer part to our board, which was nice to have that, that perspective. Um, I had tremendous respect for him. Um, even though we didn't always agree. Uh, it's one thing that this, this board always seemed to have had is there was always respect even in our disagreement. Uh, and he is someone that has served our, our foundation for, for many years and, and was an integral part of um, being 
what it's become today. So you know, we will miss him not only for the contributions that he gave to the district and to the foundation, but the community at large, uh, lots of very important person. So uh, thank you all for that. Um, and again, right in the future, we'll, we'll let you know of uh, the memorial that we'll be planning. So we'll bring this to the next item on our agenda, which is the Pledge of Allegiance. And I'm gonna turn this over to Ms. Ann Tracy to introduce uh, our Ledger Pledge. Thank you, Mr. President. I am very pleased to introduce to you Ms. Ophelia Vosa. She is a fourth grader at Hain Elementary School. Let's make her feel welcome. So Ophelia is the daughter of Ariel Sagbahan and Ariel standing here getting lots of video and photos. Um, she's also the daughter of Glaston Vosa. She is the big sister to Nate, who all of you met a little bit earlier. Hi, Nate. <laughs> Nate is also a student in Hain Elementary School. He is in first grade at Hain. So Ophelia was nominated tonight for the Pledge of Allegiance by Ms. Kristen White, our Hain Elementary School principal. Ms. White is here this evening. Thank you for being here in support of Ophelia. Also joining her is Ophelia's classroom teacher, Ms. Kim Blakely. So Kim, thank you for being here tonight as well. To share a little bit more uh, with you about our pledge student, Ophelia tells us her favorite subject is music. She wants to be a veterinarian when she grows up and she speaks a little bit of French. She traveled to at least two countries in Africa and is looking forward to another vacation like the one she took two years ago to her mom's country of birth, which is Benin, a country in West Africa. So uh, we were very excited to hear a little bit more about Ophelia and look forward to hearing about her future adventures on her trips. So at this time, I would invite everyone here and at home to stand if they are able and join us in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, Ophelia, when you are ready. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Excellent job. So as you can see, Ophelia received her items earlier this evening. She has a beautiful Seneca Valley medal, an exclusive Seneca Valley I Love the Pledge t-shirt and some Seneca swag. Uh, we also provided some of those items to Nate as well. So we thank you all for coming out this evening in support of Ophelia and for saying the pledge. So thank you very much for coming out. Thank you very much. Uh, as always, it's the highlight of the meeting is to have the I led a pledge uh, student here. So thank you again. So at this time we will make uh, or look to do the roll call. So Lisa, please. Ms. Bradle. Here. Mr. DeTulio. Here. Ms. Harrison. Here. Mr. Hester. Here. Mr. Jacobs. Here. Mr. Nichol. Present. Mr. Peterson. Here. Ms. Whittle. Here. Mr. Wittes. Here. Thank you very much. Uh, we will begin, uh, as we always do, with information reports. Uh, so, Ms. Ann Tracy. Thank you again, Mr. President. We have one item of recognition this evening. Senior Sierra Denny has been named a semifinalist in the 2021 Coca Cola Scholars Program and is now moving to the next round of the selection process for the elite title of Coca Cola Scholar. And in your backup is additional information, and certainly we wish her the best of luck. In uh, item B, for dates to remember, this month, January, is School Board Director Recognition Month. And tonight, we thank all of you for your hard work and commitment to Seneca Valley students and have placed a small token of our appreciation at each of your places. And then of course, we will be sure to get those items to any of our board members who are joining us remotely this evening. So on behalf of everyone here at Seneca Valley, we thank you for your many hours of volunteer service. January 12th is the Seneca Valley Academy of Choice Cyber and a first semester for grades seven through 12, that's tomorrow. January 15th is the end of the first semester for all others in grades seven through 12. January 18th, next Monday is Martin Luther King Jr. Day. 
and an in-service day here at Seneca Valley. Therefore, there is no school for students. January 19th, which I want to note is next Tuesday, we will return for the school board regular meeting that is at 7 p.m. here in the auditorium and on Zoom. January 26th is the report card release date for grades 7 through 12. And then finally, February 1st, we'll be back here once again for the February school board work session meeting at 7 p.m. That is all I have, Mr. President, unless you have questions. Thank you very much. Is there any questions or comments for Ms. Andresi? Seeing none on the screen, it's a little ahead behind me around the table. We seem to be good. So we'll move on at this point to agency reports and we'll start with the vote tech. So Mr. Peterson and Mr. Jacobs. Yes, we'll, oh, we'll team teach um, this brief report. There, uh, we, there has been a meeting since we were together last, both a, a regular meeting and a, an emergency meeting. Um, in terms of uh, activities, the Votech CTE is still uh, pretty much off campus in cohort fashion. Um, Dr. Heiler at the last meeting provided us with some attendance numbers and they really looked good. Um, almost all of the attendance were at 75% or better. Uh, sort of interestingly, the, 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 the teaching track with the I don't want to say worse, the uh, less than optimal uh, attendance was uh, protective services at 60%. So I think the conclusion to draw from that is that the, um, the VOTEC continues to deliver materials that are of interest to people, they're engaged, uh, and we're serving our students well that, that go up, journey up to uh, the Butler campus. Um, the second thing I would share with you, and this requires just a little bit of background, you remember the joint operating, the, the VOTEC is um, governed, so to speak, uh, a la school board fashion by uh, a body called the Joint Operating Committee. And uh, Mr. Jacobs and I represent Seneca Valley on that board. Uh, the board is composed um, of members based on the number of uh, uh, students that are going into the VOTEC. And so Butler uh, High School has the, the largest number. And so they have four representatives on the board. South Butler and Seneca Valley each have two. And then Carn City, Mars, Monito, and Slippery Rock each have one. So that gives you a sense of um, sort of the cosmopolitan um, aspect of, of the board. And um, we at the CTE, like we here at Seneca Valley, were presented with the attestation form uh, to be signed uh, to go for, by require, as requested and required by the Department of Education to go forward during the COVID outbreak. Uh, that attestation form was signed. However, uh, in an extensive conversation at our last meeting, um, the folks at the Butler school system had presented to the Secretary of Education a letter of um, uh, objection to the attestation process. And in turn, they asked uh, the rest of the JOC to send a second letter to, the, uh, to Harrisburg, uh, also objecting. There was some lively conversation around that. Um, the letter eventually uh, was approved by the JOC to be signed. Um, there was some question as to what exactly the, the, uh, the JOC expected to come out of it. And it wasn't even clear at the beginning of the conversation who the letter would be sent to. It was addressed to whom it may concern. So um, I know I won't speak for Mr. Jacobs, but I had some concerns about uh, the, the letter itself, as, as well as the um, uh, less than precise way that it was crafted. But nonetheless, the, the letter was sent. And I, uh, I guess we'll wait and see if there's any response to that. The other major item that was discussed was the refinancing of a bond, and I'll turn that over to Mr. Jacobs. And we should note that Mr. Peterson has a new role on the Butler County Vote Tech Board as well as our new vice president, so you can congratulate him for that. As Mr. Peterson said, in, in 2010, the Vote Tech undertook capital projects to improve or add to the building, and in doing so, they issued bonds for about $9 million to help fund that. 
um, you'll see on the on my business and finance section later that we are approving the refinance of some of those bonds, like we sometimes do with our bonds, where the market conditions allow for us to save on the interest related to some of those. The, the unique piece, however, here is that in 2010, Seneca Valley did not participate in that bond issue. Rather, we contributed our portion of the capital improvements in cash. And so while we're required to vote on it tonight as the authority over the board, there's no financial impact to Seneca Valley as we did not participate in those in that bond issuance. So we are to, we will vote on it tonight. Uh, we met with we met as operating committee with bond council and approved to bring it to this group. But as I said, um, no impact to Seneca Valley. And the last thing I would add, if I could, is Mr. DeTulio, there was a, before we adjourned, there were, everybody was reminded of your PISERS election and there were uh, many good words spoken about you. So maybe you were, uh, hopefully you were, you could feel the good words from the VOTEC meeting before Christmas. I thank you very much. Uh, and next week we'll, I'll be able to tell everyone how the election went. Uh, officially, so um, are there any questions on the VOTEC update? Uh, looking around the screen, I am not seeing any. I'm seeing nothing here as well. Um, thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, we'll move on to the the IU update. Uh, we did have uh, our meeting for December. Um, the only uh, item of note is the sale of the Martha Street uh, property. That's the property that we had purchased for a, a dollar uh, approximately uh, six or seven years ago. Uh, it's been nothing but a, a I'll say a money pit. Uh, it, was, it was given to us. It was something that they looked to do something to, to generate revenue and it really never took off. So we were able to sell the property for $41,000 and that sale was approved by the board um, and Harrisburg has to also approve that sale. There wasn't any objections from, uh, from anyone in, in the Harrisburg General Council. So uh, we are moving forward with finalizing that sale of the property. I think a closing is scheduled for later this month. I'm not sure the exact date. Uh, our next meeting is on the 26th. So I will have a, an update next month, uh, but nothing other than, you know, some good Christmas cheer was spread. So uh, if there's any, or if there's not any questions on the IU, uh, we'll move on in our meeting to our legislative update, and I'll go back to Mr. Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Tulio. As I usually do, I'll break my comments up into comments about the federal legislation and state legislation. A little bit different from the way I usually do it. Rather than looking back and reporting on things that have occurred, uh, I'd like to give you a little snapshot of where we are now and perhaps some forward-thinking uh, things. At the federal level, as you probably know, Betsy DeVos has uh, resigned as the Secretary of uh, Education. Um, and uh, President-elect Biden has nominated a gentleman named Miguel Cardona. Um, ironically, uh, Mr. Cardona, Dr. Cardona, uh, <laughs> earned his chops in Meriden, Connecticut, which is where I was born and brought up. And he actually taught at Israel Putnam School, where I spent a couple of years. Um, and in reading through his bio, it's maybe a little more uh, realistic to me because I can picture it. Uh, he came to the United States with his parents as non-English speaking person and went to started school without any uh, real knowledge of the English language. They lived in um, uh, the projects. And I can tell you um, when I was uh, sort of in my early teens, we lived out in the country and I had a little job on weekends and holidays delivering milk and we delivered milk. This was the days of bottles of milk when the milkman came and put it in a little you know, metal thing by your door. Um, we had a number of customers in the projects and they were pretty rough then. And probably about 10 years later when I was more involved in emergency medical services, we again often went into those projects where Dr. Cardona grew up and they were genuinely rough. Um, we, we typically wouldn't go in without a police escort. So um, when it comes to knowing about the world, I think Dr. Cardona uh, knows whereof he speaks. He became the, uh, rose through the ranks, taught in the classroom, became an assistant principal, a principal superintendent, and eventually was named the commissioner of education for the state of Connecticut. Interesting to those of us that are sort of fans of CTE, 
Uh, in Connecticut, there are high schools that are dedicated, four-year schools that are dedicated to CTE, still called technical schools. And uh, he graduated from the Wilcox Technical School in, in uh, Meriden. So let's hope that he smiles kindly on, uh, on CTE as a, in his role as the federal. <clears throat> um, the other thing about the federal legislation um, before the holidays came upon us, the Omnibus Reconciliation Act or the Budget mm -hmm. Act um, smiled kindly on education, but with all of the changes that are gonna occur, um, I, I chose not to provide you with a litany of UN enforcing facts about legislative accomplishments that may or may not ever see the light of day under the new president. Uh, nonetheless, the president, president-elect Biden uh, has uh, spoken strongly in favor of public education as opposed to uh, Secretary, former Secretary DeVos, as you know, was um, very, very much into uh, school choice. So I, I think um, it's, it's a long reach from Seneca Valley to the White House, but I think to the extent that um, Mr. Biden will uh, will guide the, the Department of Education, I think we'll do well. Uh, coming back to the state, um, the 2021-2022 uh, General Assembly convened, convened on January 5th. And if you've been watching the news, you'll know that was a rock and roll show um, with a great deal of clamor and haranguing and, and uh, words and meaning that eventually meant not much. Um, there is a Republican majority in the Senate and also in the House. And of course, Governor Wolf is Democrat. So there will be some continued friction there. Governor Wolf continues to espouse his um, significant support for public education, uh, which hopefully again will continue to benefit us. It's interesting, the House Education Secretary is a Republican from Erie. Um, I'm sorry, I, I misspoke. The House Education Chair, uh, Education Committee Chair is from Erie. The uh, Republican, the Democratic Chair is from Mercer to the north of us. And in, on the Senate side, the Senate Education Committee Chairman is from uh, Cambria, which is the Johnstown County. And as of today, there is no Senate uh, Democratic Chair, co-chair. So we've got three Western Pennsylvania folks who will obviously be influential in uh, where the state takes education again, and hopefully that will benefit all of us. And um, Governor Wolf is scheduled to give his 2021-2022 budget address on February 2nd, which of course will eventually take us down into hopefully the end of June where, where the next year's budget will be uh, presented and passed. That ends my report, Mr. Tulio, unless there's any questions. Are there any questions for Mr. Peterson? Looking around, I don't see any. Thank you very much, Mr. Peterson. Move on uh, in our agenda. Uh, in your backup, you will find the financial reports for operations, senior high activities, intermediate high activities, athletics, food services, tax collection, and capital project funds. Uh, if you have any questions on any of those, uh, please uh, get with Ms. Bernard. Uh, Mr. Peterson. Mr. President, I, I've raised this issue before, and uh, every, every month I look at the financial reports, and I see the class funds that go back to, I believe, 2010. There are thousands of dollars there that, that never move. There's never, rarely is there a disbursement. And it just seems to me we could be somehow putting that money to, to good use. We're fortunate to have the foundation that supports so many activities um, that are both on and off the, our agendas. But um, I, I just wanna raise the issue that uh, if anybody's listening that's from those classes going back again to 2010, uh, if somebody could take ownership of that and begin to apply those monies to, to benefit our activities. I think that would be a great thing. Thank you, sir, for the comments. Are there any other questions or comments on all of these uh, financial reports? Looking around, seeing none. So we'll move on uh, to the a presentation on the bond issue. And this is uh, Ms. Alicia Rich Henry, who's the managing director at PNC Capital Markets, and Mr. Christopher Brewer, who's a partner at Dis Morgan Scholl. Uh, we have the backup, and I'm not sure who is going to be starting, so I'll just uh, throw it out to the both of you. Thank you, Mr. DiTulio. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak uh, with you all tonight. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the board and administration. 
I do believe that Mr. Brewer had to leave. He had another um, engagement at 730. So I'll be happy to answer any questions that pertain um, to his side of the presentation and he will be back when you vote on the 19th. Um, without further ado, does, it, does everybody have handy um, a landscape handout that has a PNC logo that has bond financing discussion on it? Yes, I believe we all do. Okay, great. If you could flip past the first, uh, the cover, I have a two page handout um, that I have been working on for quite some time with Ms. Bertner. Um, this has been a well thought out, well analyzed, well considered and planned financing that dates back to 2018 when the first phase of the elementary school project was financed. I'd like to bring your attention and I apologize I'm learning as the years go on um, how to best present this virtually. So if anybody has any questions or you're not following, please try your best to bring it to my attention. On page one, on the very last column, I want to use that column as a starting point. The top of that column reads existing aggregate debt service. That is the existing debt service on a fiscal year basis for Seneca Valley School District as it stands today. Um, it's very level, it's very short, it extends to 2032. And most of you will remember that we were in the market about this time last year, contemplating a refinancing that ended very successfully, that almost eliminated a debt service spike that we had in 2024 that was essential to this next phase of the financing. So now if we can move over to the large gray box, we are contemplating borrowing $25 million um, with an estimated closing date of February 24th. And working very closely with Ms. Bertner, we've targeted a goal of having a year over year change of around $450,000 budgetarily, which is highlighted in the blue column. What we are doing in the very first column is we are wrapping your principal around your existing bonds. As your bonds retire currently at 2032, we are wrapping very specifically around those bonds and only extending your debt till 2034. The coupons and yields are listed in columns two and three. The annual interest is column four. We are capitalizing interest in fiscal year 22 to achieve the $450,000 moving target. Interest rates are very attractive. As of right now, these interest rates are showing an all-in TIC of a 2.48. Um, interest rates on the muni side re remain very strong. However, I'm sure some of you are aware that treasuries have trended higher recently after the elections in Georgia with some economic package to be leaved on this forefront. Um, so right now I'm estimating a 248, but we have about 25 basis points of wiggle room in this scenario. With your resolution that will be before you next week, we plan to sell bonds as soon as possible. Um, we're slated to sell bonds on Thursday, January 21st, should the resolution be adopted and funds would be in hand by the end of February. Trying to see if there's anything else. Um, the middle gray box would you be your projected aggregate gross debt service pro forma. And again, the most important column on this page is probably the blue column that shows your year over year change. It is a very, um, it's a very clean financing. Any questions on this page? Any questions from board member? Mr. Nickel. Just a quick one, Alicia. Uh, when you say capitalizing some interest in 2022, is that essentially and sort of logistically mean that we're rolling some portion of the interest into, into new principal or, or how are we capitalizing that to, to limit the year over year change to that $440,000 number? Very good question. These bonds are selling at a premium. So the amount of money we're borrowing is slightly um, confusing. 
We are going to provide $25 million to the school district at closing. However, we're only selling $22,090,000. A portion of that $22,090,000, a use of proceed is actually something called capitalizing interest. So we are borrowing that interest as part of the bond issue. Okay. That's fine. Thank you. You're very welcome. Very good question. I should have explained that. Are there any other questions from any board members? Or up top either. Oh, Dr. Vitale. Yes, if I could have um, a brief review for the public who may be tuning in for the first time in regards to this from Ms. Reesh Henry. How do we compare our debt ratio and the amount of things that we've borrowed here at Seneca Valley? How do we compare with other districts without naming those that you work with at PNC? Thank you, Dr. Vitale, and a very good question. Um, I will be honest, and um, you, you stack up to, to, to no other peers. You are my highest rated client, and I work with almost 85, 90 school districts. Um, you are a AA1 rated school district, um, which has recently been affirmed, which is also hard to do during COVID. So um, I would say you, you, you stack up exceptionally well up against anyone. Thank you. And by way of our debt compared to other school districts, um, certainly our rating, uh, we're very pleased. The board has worked strategically to get that rating uh, where we needed it to be. It wasn't always there. But how do we rate uh, and compare to other school districts when it comes to debt? I would say your debt um, is fairly short. Your ultimate borrowing horizon is under 15 years. Um, obviously, it's probably not fair to compare the amount of debt you have outstanding to some smaller school districts, but to comparably sized districts, your debt is well fit within um, your parameters. Again, something else that I think that you guys do exceptionally mm -hmm. well um, that I really don't do with any other district is this has been a plan of finance that was initiated uh, probably as far back as 2016 to be able to afford this project in a well thought out and a well managed budgetary process. Um, as I mentioned before, the first tranche of the elementary school project was financed in 2018. Um, Ms. Bertner spends relentless hours reviewing um, tens of twenties of scenarios that we, we ultimately present to you the best way to finance these projects. So there is a lot of careful consideration that your school district goes above and beyond to make sure you are doing the best for your constituents. Mr. Peterson. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> so I'm gonna ask a question. I'm not sure I understand. I'm not a finance guy, but um, in your notes, it said it assumes no plan con reimbursement. Um, as you know, we've got two significant capital projects underway now, may have a third during the life of these bonds. And with the changes that may occur in Washington and tr trickle down through the state, if plan con does kick in, what impact will that have on this transaction? Well, I can't really assess um, any direct monetary value. What I can say is, and this might ring a bell, when we <clears throat> went through the Act 34 hearing, um, you did all the necessary measures necessary that should plan con become available to you again in the future, this could become a plan con eligible project. So I don't want to mislead you to tell you I have any idea what plan con could have meant to you should that program still be operable, but you have put yourself in the position that if that went, door does open back up, that we could complete all the necessary steps. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any other questions or comments? Uh, I, I guess the only other uh, comment that I'll make, uh, this is you know, more for the general public, is our debt service, which is the yearly amount, you know, I think <clears throat> is, your, is your mortgage that you would pay. We're paying uh, less than 8% uh, of, of uh, our budget towards debt service. Other districts in our area, if you look around, you'll see some as high as 12, uh, maybe 13%. Uh, so where we are, it's been a deliberate, keep it low, keep it level, keep it short for a number of years since I've been on the board. 
um, and, and to um, Ms. Reese Henry's uh, comments, uh, Ms. Bertner has been integral to making sure that, that we do plan. Um, and same with Dr. Vitell, you know, we started our long-term capital projects needs back in 2014, um, knowing that we were gonna have to address the issues of a replacement building uh, at that Evans City School, uh, knowing that we had these other maintenance capital projects that were gonna have to take place. So we're not a reactionary, we, we definitely plan it out. Uh, we've done it with the PISA obligations that we've had, making sure that we set money aside to minimize those impacts as much as possible. So this is another one. And I know, uh, you know, Mr. Brewer, Ms. Reach Henry have been, uh, you know, working with us, you know, that whole entire time, basically, um, to make sure that we get the best deals that we can, and that we're able to do that, you know, consistently with uh, good ratings as well. So uh, thank you for being part of the team. And you know, thank you for presenting uh, everything you did this evening. And we may or may not see you next week. Uh, you know, when we do the actual vote, or will that be Mr. Brewer alone? Um, I plan on attending as well, just in case anybody has any market questions, as it is the week that we plan to be in the market. So I, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to give you a, um, a financial overview tonight in advance of the legal resolution that will be on your agenda for next week that Mr. Brewer will be able to review with you at that time. Okay. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, well, one more, Mr. Nickel. I just, I wanted to just echo uh, your sentiment, Mr. DeTulio. I'm a, I'm a finance guy in my day job. I don't work specifically with public finance. I'm more, you know, working with middle market for-profit companies. But the, the couple of quick comments I wanted to make for my colleagues on the board and for the, you know, the 168 attendees is that uh, debt is always part of a capital structure of a business. It just is, right? Whether that's a for-profit business or, uh, you know, a, a public entity like ours. And we are, at least and this is one person's opinion, we are prudently layering in debt capital as part of our capital structure. And in one context, you can look at it as sort of, okay, what's our overall level of indebtedness? And then as Mr. Dottulio pointed out, what is our debt service on an, on an annual basis? And you know, back to the comment or two that uh, was made uh, with, with regard to Ms. Bertner, uh, painstakingly making sure um, even though we've had some material projects that we're undertaking and have some more into the future to Mr. Peterson's point, that we're keeping that debt service level uh, at, a, at a level that we are comfortable with and feel is prudent. And I would echo the sentiment that we've done that prudently. Um, and we really, did, I don't know if we got onto to the next page of your presentation, uh, Ms. Henry, but we're thinking of what's next, right? And there's another $20 million, I think is in 2022. And even those levels of our debt service for our district are ones are that are feasible and prudent and make sense and balance fiscal responsibility with the need to you know take care of some of our macro projects so i just i want i, I wanted to just echo your sentiment mr Dutulio, and uh, i think we're in, i think we're personally i think we're in very good shape financially as a district and that's that's borne out in our debt rating to your point Ms. henry yes and thank you mr nickel for bringing up and i i don't need to go into this um page three, but to your point, this doesn't work if you look at each financing in a vacuum, you have to look at all pieces. So in order to look at piece two, I had to make sure it melded with piece three as we layer it on top of it. So it is a moving target. So piece three is factored into how we're gonna sell bonds in piece two, just to further echo how well planned out these financings are so that you have been able to provide um, excellent services for your students and facilities. Thank you very much. If uh, look around the room and on the screen for any last minute comments and seeing none, uh, we thank you very much for the, the time and we will see you next week. Yes, thank you very much, everyone. Have a good night. So with that issue out of the way, we will move on to the next item agenda, which is diversity, equity and inclusion DEI update, Dr. Vitell. Thank you. We are going to begin giving an update at least once a month to the board so that you know the work that we have been doing, continue to do, and where we're headed into the future when it comes to the topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So just a brief overview that the board um, has known about, but I want to make sure to refresh your memory as well as the public that's joining us. We have had a district-wide diversity committee for approximately 20 years. And we've had diversity committee members who are both employees and community at large members uh, join us uh, for 
ongoing regular meetings over the years. We also um, had students approach us in 2015 that they wanted to create a student diversity committee as well. So we've had that established since 2015 and the students have revamped a portion of that committee that I'll have Dr. Roberts talk about next. We began working with a diversity consultant in 2012. Her name is Dr. Tricia Gadson, and she began working with our diversity committee, both internally and our community at large members as a consultant in 2012-2013. Dr. Gadsden, um, and again, a review for the community. I think a few board members have met her, but they certainly know her work. She has a PhD in community engagement from Point Park University. She has a master's of science in professional leadership with a concentration in training and program development from Carlo University. She also attended Syracuse University where she obtained a bachelor's of science in psychology. Mrs. Gadsden, or Dr. Gadsden rather, began a career in child welfare at Newport News, Virginia. And she worked for the Department of Social Services as a child protective service worker during her time there. Following her relocation to Pennsylvania, she began her tenure at the Allegheny County Children, Youth and Family Services. Currently, Dr. Gadsden is the Chief Executive Officer of Macedonia Family and Community Enrichment Center acronym FACE, and this is a social service outreach agency of Macedonia Church in the Hill District of Pittsburgh. She is a nationally certified Olveus Bullying Prevention Program trainer and consultant, and she's a recognized diversity and inclusion trainer, obtaining training from the National Multicultural Institute. She also serves as a trainer and curriculum writer for the Child Welfare Training Program of the University of Pittsburgh. And she's a former school board member at McKeesport Area School District. Other work that we have um, engaged in with Dr. Gadsden in the past, in the first year that we began working with her, she um, worked with our district diversity committee on diversity inclusion training and assisted with the development of our mission, vision, vision statement and goals for both that, commu commu that committee as well as our district strategic planning. In 2016 and 17, as a follow-up to her previous work with the committee, Ms. Boback worked closely with her and asked her to return for three training meetings that year. And the purpose of Ms. Boback's request at that time was to have Dr. Gadsden challenge our thinking and practices from an outside perspective and an expert in the field of diversity, equity, and inclusion. During this time, Dr. Gadsden also supported another revision to our mission statement in both the diversity committee and challenged us to rethink our approach in that diversity committee. In addition, she previously facilitated sessions with our new teacher induction program. So that is to give you a brief um, overview of the things that we've been doing with our consultant in DEI work since 2012. In 2013-14, I mentioned she began doing training in the new teacher induction training program, and all teachers in the district received a half day of diversity training with Dr. Gadsden. Some of that training has been, in, been on pause this year, as it has been difficult to pull teachers out of classrooms when they have limited time with children this year. However, we are pushing forward with more DEI work. I can tell you that in 2008 and 2009, we revamped our hiring practices. I wrote my dissertation at the University of Pittsburgh and defended that on hiring practices in the state of Pennsylvania. We revamped our interview protocols based off the work of Dr. James Strong and Dr. Jenny Heinemann from William & Mary. These are now under review again, because it's always good to stay on top of our hiring practices analyzing things like nepotism in all school districts across Pennsylvania and here at Seneca Valley. And it's always good to be looking and having consultants from the outside look in to make sure that we're not missing anything when it comes to our hiring practices to make sure we have fair and equitable hiring practices. In 2019, Dr. Gadsden had so much work as a consultant. She began a, and opened an LLC called Racial Engagement. So since 2019, and she has a website for her LLC, we've been um, actively engaged with her about racialized discussions. In the summer of 2019, uh, Ms. Boback and I sat down with Dr. Gadsden 
for advice on how to recruit and hire more teacher candidates of color. Dr. Gadsden laid out a comprehensive plan in the summer of 2019 for us, and the district began contracting with her for comprehensive diversity training for our entire leadership team, 45 people, principals, assistant principals, and directors at central office. Some of the samples of that training and topics and agenda have already been shared with the board, but just to remind our public about some of the things that we did. In the fall of 2019, our executive core team at central office read the book. So you wanna talk about race by Ijoma Olu. And we then shared some of those concepts and racialized discussions with our leadership team. Dr. Gadsden's objectives in working with our team in the fall of 2019 before the pandemic were to observe and assess Seneca Valley's organizational culture and structure. She presented information and facilitated racialized conversations at a number of our leadership team meetings on a monthly basis in the fall of 2019. She also surveyed the leadership team on our comfort level in having and engaging in racialized conversations. I don't think it's um, a surprise to uh, many here that we are a predominantly white community. And sometimes it can be difficult for um, white people to talk about race. Uh, white people are sometimes, and I know I'm generalizing, so I'll speak for myself, that um, we don't want to offend or say anything wrong. And if we're not comfortable with racialized conversations, um, we could then avoid those conversations in our schools with our African-American children and our children of color and, and our families of color. And we want to make sure that we're not avoiding those conversations, that instead we are listening and learning and being open to those conversations. Topics and themes um, last fall before the pandemic and we all received training, 45 of us in the leadership team received training on courageous conversation protocols. How do you have racialized conversations if you've never had those conversations? What is silence dialogue? What does that mean in DEI work? Color blindness, white fragility, deficit thinking, community engaged pedagogy, terminology of race, racism and opportunity gaps, redlining, which I have to tell you in our leadership team of 45 people, 43 are white. And many of us had never heard the term redlining before when it comes to real estate. And when it comes to black history, many of us have had limited courses on black history. And so all of those things, uh, Dr. Gadsden brought, brought training to the table for us. And um, we thoroughly avoid of, thoroughly enjoyed that training with Dr. Gadsden. Before the uh, pandemic in March, in February of last year, we were working on how to roll that out to the front line, to our teachers, the type of training we received. And then how do you do that in a way that's comprehensive and not just one and done, one training and then we walk away, we check the box and say, we've done DEI training. So we have been working with Dr. Gadsden um, since March as well, we were on a pause in March, April, May on DEI training, but we resumed that again um, after we returned to school here this fall in 2020. And so where were we, where are we going and what will we do next? You've heard a little bit about where we were, where we're going. As a district, we've tried to take a posture of listening uh, we've had some comprehensive professional development and we're pushing forward with comprehensive professional development now for all of our employees. Of course, doing this virtually can be a little more challenging. We um, are training our teachers to have racialized conversations. As Dr. Gadsden has pointed out to us, the more we have these conversations, the more comfortable we should get with those conversations. We are compiling and providing resources for our students, our teachers, and our community. We are examining our curriculum in curriculum meetings, K to 12, kindergarten through 12, for implicit bias, prejudice, or racism. And we are addressing those findings with our DEI consultant, Dr. Gadsden. We're examining our school district policies for implicit bias, prejudice, or racism, and addressing those findings as well. We are building level professional libraries and resources for our teachers. We already had these in many of our buildings, but we're going back through and updating those and asking our teachers what they would like to see. 
A lot of that curriculum work, as you know, goes on with Dr. McCarty and Dr. McKinley. Some of that has been on pause. And then when we are back to school five days a week, they bring that back in. When we're in cohort, they bring that back in if they have subs for the teachers. We have engaged our black and brown alum, alumni, um, plural, and you've met some of them at a school board meeting during the pandemic. Um, we're going to continue to roll out teacher diversity training. Where I would say we have been as a district has been in a technical mode when it comes to DEI, and we are now moving to adaptive. And Dr. Gatson has um, told us this is the tough part of the work. Technical is, what do you have in line? What type of training have you done? And you check the boxes, we've done all of that. But adaptive is really about systemic change. And so what we're doing now, you may be interested to know, the core team has analyzed this document. It's from the Casey Foundation. It's called Race, Equity and Inclusion Action Guide. And it's seven steps to advance and embed race, equity and inclusion within your organization. This guide was developed for nonprofit organizations but we feel that this guide um, really can take us from technical to adaptive when it comes to approaches. So we have uh, begun, begun to talk about this briefly with our, our leadership team, and we'll be doing more work using the Anne E. Casey Foundation guide as our template for the work that we're doing moving forward. We are talking about how to increase our racial consciousness and how to develop racial literacy in our last month leadership team meeting, we talked about a number of these issues that we're working on with Dr. Gadsden on a monthly basis. And the leadership team began opening up even beyond race. What have we done from a diversity inclusion perspective in the past and what do we need to be looking at now? So we're having more conversations about that with Dr. Gadsden. From my perspective, I have been working on engaging our community and tonight updating the school board and the public. And I'm also working on the possibility of doing some regional collaboration with other school superintendents. Dr. McKinley, our assistant superintendent of secondary is funneling this work through his curriculum meetings. He's also working on a new African-American history course as an elective. That was one of the recommendations you heard from our alum about courses and curriculum. We are hoping that will be ready to roll out for next fall. You may hear about that in upcoming scheduling meetings. Dr. McCarty is vetting our book and resource list in the elementaries. Ms. Boback is working on the HR piece that I talked about, protocols, recruitment discussions with Dr. Gadsden. Dr. Roberts, who you will hear from next, he ran a, a really great community stakeholder meeting, and I want him to talk a little bit about that. And he also was involved with our students and our student diversity committee with a new regional collaborative among students acronym SHOUT. Dr. Polano has been analyzing our data composition of the district programming ESL, English as a second language and interventions. And then every month our core team has coaching sessions with Dr. Gadsden and Dr. Gadsden will be attending our leadership team meeting this month to talk about what have we done with DEI since March, since the last time she met with leadership team? What's going on at the building levels, technical versus adaptive work? How does the Casey tool fit into the work that we're doing for principals and on the front line with our teachers? And the principals will begin reporting out what are some of the successes and challenges that they have in their buildings when it comes to DEI work. At this point, I'd like to go to Dr. Roberts, and he can talk about the community stakeholder meeting, social handprints overcoming unjust treatment in the shout meetings with students regionally and in other school districts. And then I would open it up for the board to ask us any questions they may have about the DEI work that we're doing. Dr. Roberts. Thank you, Dr. Vital. As you mentioned a couple of minutes ago, the diversity committee has been in existence for a number of years. And pre previously, we met in person during the school day. Um, that certainly created challenges for community members to attend uh, based on work schedules, childcare, and those kinds of things. Um, and so I'll say that the restrictions this year related to the pandemic have allowed us to uh, think differently. And we, we did meet during the day, but by meeting virtually, it was uh, much more accessible for our community stakeholders. Um, the meetings that we have done this year have been focused specifically 
on parents and community members. Um, before our committee was primarily district employees. Um, and in order for us to get a broader perspective, we really needed to uh, involve our community and listen carefully to parents and alumna, and uh, of course the community as well. Uh, this past summer, we were contacted by a number of folks uh, that were concerned about diversity and, and events in the world um, and asked if they could help the district. Um, and from that, we founded the Community Diversity Committee uh, to proactively get that input that we were looking for. Um, and we were asking the question of them, how is Seneca Valley progressing with regard to diversity, equity, and inclusion? And where can we improve? The format of the meetings is designed so that district staff can hear the concerns of our community members clearly, um, and the topics for discussion are provided by the community members. Um, and we structure things so that um, the community members are in the ma majority um, as we're having those dialogues. While in a public meeting like tonight, uh, participants' titles are important and you can see some of them on your screen uh, if you're remote. Uh, in a diversity dialogue, we invited participants to only use their first and last name. Um, because of course, titles can sometimes be a barrier to true empathy and understanding. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we had uh, an open conversation that didn't provide uh, arbitrary barriers like that. Our last meeting with the stakeholders focused on combating racism and curriculum that supports diver diversity, equity, and inclusion. Our next meeting for the community group is slated for February. Now transitioning a little bit to shout, um, I'm really excited about the opportunities that exist for our students. I was part of the uh, beginning of the Student Diversity Committee back in 2015. And uh, as Dr. Vital mentioned, it was an offshoot of the, the district's committee. Um, and the student committee focused on amplifying students' voices so that schools could respond appropriately uh, to concerns that they had and for us to be um, better teachers of diversity in our schools. Um, in July of this year, we were invited uh, by student leaders from South Fayette High School to consider affiliating with their SHOUT program. Um, they had a similar committee to ours and were developing um, a structure that would allow us to impact the entire Southwest Pennsylvania region. Uh, as Dr. Vital mentioned, SHOUT stands for Social Handprints Overcoming Unjust Treatment. Uh, the concept of hands overcoming footprints, uh, so hands being helpful things and footprints being the negative things that, that happen to people. Um, so our students are learning how they can be hands and, and be assisting and, and be promoting diversity in our community. The committee's currently open to students in grades nine through 12. And uh, we're in conversations right now with Ryan Glory Middle School to be able to include our eighth grade students as well in the near future. Uh, we intend SHOUT to be a safe space for students to embrace, embrace their individuality and to become knowledgeable about DEI. And of course, the group is not just focused on Seneca Valley, uh, but will be involved uh, along with the partner schools in our region. And uh, the other schools that are SHOUT chapters right now include Fox Chapel, Hampton, Kiski area, Avonworth, Chartiers Valley, Cannon Mac, and of course, South Fayette. Uh, so all of those districts have banded together to provide this opportunity for our students, which I think is fantastic. Uh, at this point, we're open for any questions you might have. Thank you. Are there any questions from the board members? Eric, if I could. Oh, go ahead, Mr. Jacobs. Um, well, first of all, thank you both very much. Dr. Vital, does, does Dr. Gadsden, does she or, or any of the other consultants we've talked to do they give an opinion on, um, apologies, because I'm a bit of a numbers guy, do they give opinions on using our traditional measures of success, performance in the classroom, standardized testing, engagement in activities um, among our diverse or non-diverse students and using those as a measure of success or do they warn against that or, or do they give any kind of context in that regard? No, um, we've talked at length with Dr. Gadsden, you know, if you just look at numbers when it comes to recruiting and hiring. Okay, so should we have a certain amount of percent to reflect the certain amount of our student body? Um, we have not had discussions about numbers related to that. Instead, we've talked about our system 
that should it be about numbers or should it instead be about being inclusive and talking about equity when it comes to student learning. And so we've had more discussions about, you know, that this is a community that's predominantly white and we want to make sure that we are welcoming to people who are different than us, to people who have different skin color, and we want to make sure that we're being inclusive so that when children, people in our community, but also when children walk through our doors, they feel welcome and they feel included. And so we're analyzing right now our system, policies, HR, protocols, curriculum, to look for implicit bias. Because at the end of the day, it's not a separate category is what they've shared with us, the consultants, that it should be a lens through which we view everything that we do in all of those areas, not one. And so um, there is not a certain percentage. If we're being fair and equitable and inclusive, then um, I think you will see an increase in um, staffing, uh, people of color, students of color. When people feel welcome, they want to live here and be here. And we know Seneca Valley is a great community. And while many of us think we are being welcoming, and I hope that we are, and you know, we're teaching that to children how to be inclusive. You know, the, the Olveus anti-bullying program that we had many years ago that we've revamped. That's all about equity and inclusion and fairness and being kind and being helpful. And so teaching those types of skills will create a system in our community that some of it's already there. It's about propping that up and making sure that we don't shy away from the difficult things that sometimes human beings are afraid to talk about. Any other comments? Uh, excellent job as always. And, and hopefully now uh, coming out of, of you know, the COVID, you know, this will be something that we can uh, start seeing more at the forefront again. I, I know it's been going on, but you know, in person is always a better way for these things to occur. So uh, thank you very much for the update. Uh, seeing that there's no other questions or comments, we'll move on to our COVID-19 update and we'll go back to Dr. Vitell. Thank you. I apologize in advance for doing a lot of talking this evening, but this of course is a topic that we try to keep our community informed about and our parents informed about and our teaching staff informed about and we have a lot of communications and at times people are saturated with the amount of communications coming from the school, from government, from communities. So I have tried to narrow down the talking points, but I will tell you since we only met one time in December and this is what people want to hear about, I will be highlighting quite a few points this evening. First, I would like to start, this is a COVID-19 update for the Seneca Valley School District and I'll start with quantitative data. So when people say, how do you make these decisions? If you're not in the decision-making process here in the school, if you're not in the decision-making process in government, and I'm not, you start to feel disenfranchised. You start to feel like you're getting a lot of mixed messages. And so we're doing our very best to show you and be transparent why we're making the decisions we're making here at the board level. So the quantitative data that we use um, as of today, you can look at the Seneca Valley COVID dashboard. It's back up and running again as of last week. And the cases that we currently have active. Now keep in mind, we could have had cases over the holiday break that were reported to us, but they don't count towards our 14 day rolling average with the state because those students weren't in school or the, those staff members weren't in school. So the current active cases, which means they've been in school at least one day or two or more, and they've reported them to us. This could be staff or students. We are sitting on five active student cases or staff cases in the district and one student case. We have two staff. When I say staff, we have approximately 900 employees. So when I say staff, this isn't just teachers. This could be cafeteria, it could be paraprofessionals who are teacher aides. It could be administrators. It could be, you know, and that breakdown is on our um, uh, dashboard. But I want you to be aware we have five active staff cases as of today, and that was updated at 1150 
a.m. We try to update that by noon now if we can. We have, uh, keep in mind, grades 7 through 12 is not yet back. So when we say we have one student case, that is in the K-6 to program. We have um, four days that students were in session last week, K-6 to every other day. And so that's two days. And we have the secondary students that will be starting on Wednesday. I want you to be aware we do have 75 students and 12 staff who are fulfilling quarantines. Those are not due to exposures in the school. Those are outside of school and primarily over the winter break. Our community transmission rate, Butler County community transmission rate for the state, that is a trigger as to whether or not we can be in full five days a week programming for our students per the Pennsylvania Department of Health and Pennsylvania Department of Education. Butler County is still listed as substantial community transmission. They are telling us in order to get back to the possibility of five days a week or an option of five days a week, we need to be in the moderate category as a county. The moderate category means less than 100 new cases in a seven day period. And the other benchmark is PCR positivity rate needs to be lower than 10%. We've shared this in other meetings, but I'm repeating it to remind you. Local data here, we also track the Seneca Valley zip codes. We go into every community zip code in the Seneca Valley School District, and Lisa tracks that every day from the Pennsylvania Department of Health dashboard. This is all public data. This is not something that is secret. You can look it up, as well as that Butler County community transmission rate. It's all on the Pennsylvania Department of Health website. I want to remind the public that when we opened school in September, we were seeing approximately four to five new cases on average in a week in our county. Get your head around that. Four to five new cases per week. Today, we are seeing between 150 and 200 new cases per day on average. Our latest 14-day rolling average just for the Seneca Valley zip codes is 156 new cases per day. That shows you community transmission. That gives you an idea of where our numbers are. Before we left for winter break, in the zip codes and in the county, they were some of the highest they had been. The good news is they're starting to come down a little. We've seen some plateaus. We've seen some dips down. That's a good thing, but we're nowhere near where we were in the fall. And the experts, the medical experts are telling us we may not see that for a little while. The new thresholds for closing. Many of you know that right before Thanksgiving break, the Pennsylvania Department of Education, in collaboration with the Pennsylvania Department of Health, put out what's called an attestation form for school superintendents and board presidents. I don't feel comfortable making unilateral decisions for this entire district. I think this should be a collaborative decision. So I went to the entire board and in consultation with this board, Mr. Nickel and I signed that attestation form. We had to agree. First of all, you should know if we didn't sign it, we were told by the Pennsylvania Department of Education and the Pennsylvania Department of Health, they would close us down and we would have to go remote. So we didn't have much choice, much choice about signing it. And so that was um, disheartening to us. But nevertheless, in signing it, we had to agree that if we wanna do any in-person instruction, we had to agree to very strict universal masking requirements. We had to agree that during lunch when students pull their mask down to eat, that they would be six feet apart regardless of the plexiglass. And you know, we've invested a lot of um, CARES money, federal money in plexiglass here. And we had to agree to uh, fully implement all of our safety protocols. And many of those we were already doing, but the separating students six feet apart, we were using plexiglass to separate them. So now that was new for us. In addition, we had to agree to new thresholds for closing. So there is a chart and you can find this again on the Pennsylvania Department of Education website. There are links on our COVID-19 page on our website. It's called Responding to COVID-19 Cases at School. This new chart has been updated and revised. Household contacts were taken off of that, off the old chart for the new chart. 
So if you have two siblings in one home that go to the same school, that now counts as two cases, not one. If you have three siblings in one home, and maybe even an employee, a district employee in that home, that could be four cases in one home, and that could jeopardize your building being open. So these thresholds are much lower than what we saw before. School superintendents did complain to the Department of Education that the original chart was unfair to big districts and small districts. So they divided the new chart into small, medium, large. It helped us in some ways in our larger buildings, but in our medium buildings, our elementaries are all medium buildings. The thresholds are still set pretty low. But we must follow those thresholds because we signed the attestation form. Another item we take into consideration is COVID deaths in the county. Butler County is at 252 as of today when I looked. That, and that's the total since the pandemic began. A majority of those have those COVID deaths were in late November and December. However, the age on those COVID deaths are, uh, most of them are in the 70 and up range. So that's important for us to take note of. Another way we look at how to make a decision of, can we be open in cohort? Can we be open five days a week if we're allowed, per permitted by the state? Um, can we be open at all? Do we have to be in remote? We look at staffing. Our staffing continues to be critically low due to quarantines. If we hit the number of 25 teachers in a quarantine, we may not be able to staff our buildings physically. And we've been sharing that with the board for months. That hasn't changed. Today, we have 16 total staff in quarantine. Now, again, that's total staff. That isn't all teachers. Luckily, we have a memorandum of understanding with our teacher group, with our teacher union, that if they have COVID or and or get caught in a quarantine in, you know, aside from school, that they can teach from home remotely and they have some protocols they have to put in place in order to do that. But that helps us quite a bit if we're still in the cohort model, or even if we're able to go back to the five day a week, we can have a teacher stream into the classroom and still teach their class if they feel well enough to do that. If they're in a quarantine with no symptoms, most have done that. And we've done that with a great deal of success, but we still have to have supervision in that classroom where we physically have children. And so, as you know, this district hired 23 what we call super subs and across the district 23 subs come in to cover those types of classrooms where we need supervision. Or if the teacher is too sick and can't teach at all those super subs and they have just they've been wonderful and they've helped us out quite a bit. We are lucky in that way, but we just don't know as we continue to move forward how bad staffing could get we've asked parents to be patient with us. We will fight to keep these buildings physically open as much as we can for as long as we can, but we have to have staff. Our quarantine time period, um, the CDC has recommended in some cases you could go from 14 to 10. The Pennsylvania Department of Health has recommended in some cases you could go from 14 to 10. And in some cases we have been able to do that and families are working with our nurses and our staff are working with our school nurses to determine if they can do a 10 instead of a 14 day, it does depend on the context situation, uh, whether you've had a direct exposure, whether you're symptomatic and, and all of those things that we've all been living through. Testing availability, I will tell you is still problematic in our county. We are lucky we have our own health system, our own hospital, but even to be tested there, you have to have a doctor slip to get the test. In some of our facilities like a Med Express in our community don't have to have a doctor slip, but we have found, at least through our employees, qualitative data, sometimes they run out of rapid tests by noon in our county. So testing availability is still problematic. If I can't get a rapid test and I'm not symptomatic, let's say I need it for travel, um, I have to wait for that PCR that can take anywhere from three to five days. Those are coming back a little quicker, but it depends on the labs and the backup in the labs. Also, when we are making decisions, I've told you before and I'll tell you again, I don't make medical decisions. I have a doctorate in education. I don't have any background in medicine and I'm not qualified to make those decisions. We rely on our school nurses to help us on the front line with decisions 
about case investigations. They work with the Department of Health. We have a nurse administrator, Nurse Williams, who's reporting back to me, to the board. We're staying in close contact with our school nurses. They have been fabulous. As a side note, all of our school nurses were vaccinated by Butler Health System this um, past or last week. And then our school nurse subs were vaccinated on Friday. We're very lucky that didn't happen in every county that they were offered. Our nurses were offered the Pfizer vaccine and they received their first dose. They will go in two and a half more weeks to get their second dose. They were pretty excited about that and we were pretty happy. But also when it comes to who do we consult with about these types of decisions? We consult with the following local medical experts beyond the Pennsylvania Department of Health. Dr. David Rottinghouse, he's the Chief Medical Officer and Vice President of Medical Affairs, Emergency Medicine Specialist at Butler Health System. Dr. John Love, uh, he's at Butler Health System as well. He's an expert in infectious disease. He too is a doctor at Butler Health System. He is on with Dr. Rottinghouse on a call with all school, school superintendents in Butler County every Monday at 2 p.m. Dr. Greg Hellyer, UPMC Emergency Medicine. He too is on that emergency uh, management call Mondays at 2 p.m. where the school superintendents have the opportunity to ask the experts what they think about cohort model five days a week, infection rate in the community, what are they seeing in the hospitals? And we are grateful. I don't know of many counties that are collaborating like that. Our Butler County commissioners are on that call and emergency management personnel, as well as county departments like children and youth. So we're all um, very well connected and we have been meeting every Monday at 2 p.m. since March. We have not missed a week. So I think that's really important and then we have our own in-house expert at the table here with us, Mr. Fred Peterson, who is our school board member and has extensive background in public health and emergency medicine. So we're grateful that every time I call him, he picks up the telephone as well. So again, I, I just wanna point out to the public and to our staff, I'm not making these decisions alone, thank goodness, and I'm never making medical decisions. The next item we want to point out as quantitative data, again, the uh, PCR positivity rate in this county, the most recent seven days, January 1st through 7th, is at 14.4%. That is down from the week prior at 16.5%. Again, going in the right direction, still not where we need it to be to bring students back five days a week, according to PDE and the Department of Health, but it's going in the right direction. Incident rate is another big trigger. I've already told you about that. The most recent seven days in Butler County, January 1st through the 7th, and they look at this, uh, the Department of Health per 100,000 residents, we are at 294.9 incident rate. That is down from the previous week at 317.2, 317.2. So again, going in the right direction. These are not huge moves, but they are moves in the right direction. The differences in weekly confirmed cases we are down by 55 cases comparing January 1st through the 7th to December 25th through the 31st. So that too is good news. The Butler County daily COVID rate, I shared with you that um, our lowest 14 day rolling average has been uh, most recently 143.1, 143 new cases in the 14 day rolling average that's the lowest since December 11th. So again, good news. They aren't great numbers, but they're going in the right direction. I've already talked about zip code COVID cases and I've already talked about our dashboard. So let me go now to vaccinations. So as I talked about our nurses who were recently vaccinated, we would like nothing more than to uh, see all of our teachers get vaccinated if they want the vaccination. We will not be requiring this at the Seneca Valley School District. It will be optional, but it needs to get to their group next. Teachers that work and educators who work closely with students are classified in the Pennsylvania vaccine plan and the federal vaccine plan as a 1B group of essential workers. Right now, this county and many counties are still on the 1A group, vaccinating doctors, nurses, healthcare providers, and our nurses were in that group. 
So we don't know if that will be a week, two weeks, two months, we don't know. But I can tell you that all of the superintendents in Butler County are advocating and working closely with the Butler Health System to get our teachers vaccinated as soon as we possibly can. The next item I want to share with you related to COVID is an employee assistance program. Seneca Valley and many of the school districts in this county have never had an employee assistance program for our employees. We recognize that this pandemic has taken a toll on everyone's mental health. We cannot take care of children if we don't take care of ourselves. So self-care, as we know, is very important. Our healthcare, we took this topic to our healthcare consortium. They have contracted with a company called Washington EAP to provide information about life services, mental health services to our employees and et cetera. Dr. McKinley was uh, pushing for this heavily. He went to Ms. Bertner, she took it to the consortium. That all happened in November, December. So more information will be coming out to our employees about additional confidential services that they can access for self-help and mental health. The next item, as more and more of us are um, learning about those who are passing from COVID, our staff is experiencing um, you know, the grieving process, whether it's in their own family or with students' families. So we um, do have a link to the Highmark Caring Place in Warrendale. We have encouraged our employees and our students' families about the Highmark Caring Place in Warrendale, and that has been um, a really great resource for us in dealing with grief. I'd like to address some operational questions. We've had a few school board emails and a few questions that I would like to address in, um, in this public session. The first question we had from a few parents was, why did elementary kindergarten through sixth grade return a week before grades seventh through 12th? Now this could be a three hour discussion. Let me try to boil this down to less than a minute for you. Number one, COVID transmission. According to the public health experts and the medical doctors that we're consulting with and all the latest research, and we all know that's changing every day, the research indicates that, and we've been saying this, this is not new, but more and more of it continues to come out, that children ages 10 and below are not transmitting the virus like teenagers or adults at the same level of teenagers and adults. There is some scientific background and medical background as to why that is. I'm not qualified to get into all of that, but that's something that we know from the research. We also know that children are still getting COVID. It's not that they're not getting it, but they don't seem to be the one transmitting the ones transmitting it to others. We're not seeing student to student transmission in our buildings. We're not seeing student to teacher transmission in our buildings. While they are still getting the virus, much of our anecdotal research here at Seneca Valley has indicated that young children that contract the virus and the parents report it to us are getting it from caregivers, parents, grandparents, relatives, primarily adults. This would parallel with what the health experts are telling us. Second reason why, academics. While all children who choose the in-person model need to be here. The remote environment is especially challenging for our students that are our youngest learners. K-1-2 on a computer for seven hours, you know, if you're a parent, you know what I'm talking about. So that was another reason we needed to bring them back uh, quicker. Socialization, all children need a certain level for development. The older children do have, although they all need to be here, I recognize that, the older children do have some social networks. They have social interaction um, options like sports, extracurriculars that we're trying to keep going, virtual networks like social media and gaming, not that we love that as educators, but they have some of that and the younger ones don't seem to have that K1, 2, 3, 4 as compare in, in comparison. So those are the three main areas that we were focused on as educators as to why elementary needed to come back the week prior to secondary, who will start this week. Also, we needed to make sure that we had enough staff. 
So phasing in when students would return in the cohort model allowed us to assess what staff had COVID over the break that reported it to us, how many staff we would have come in, and would we have the staff to keep things like our cafeteria open? You know, those are all things people don't necessarily think about. They think just about teachers and that's important, but you know, these are big operations. School districts are big operations. And although the bus drivers are not our employees, we contract them out. We have two busing companies that we have to make sure we have bus drivers to bring kids to school as well. So that, that's always a consideration. Last week, the PA DOH, Pennsylvania Department of Health and the Pennsylvania Department of Education issued another set of new guidance for school districts on January 7th, late in the day. So I want to point this out. This guidance permits blended learning. That's what we refer, refer to here as the cohort or hybrid, the state calls it, as an allowable option for elementary schools in counties experiencing substantial community transmission. The advice and recommendations prior to the break was, no, you should keep everyone in remote K to 12 as long as you're in substantial. But the messaging on this to the public was, open all your schools five days a week and bring the elementary kids back five days a week because they don't seem to be transmitting it at the rate the teenagers are. However, what people didn't know, because again, you have to read all the details of, uh, from the Department of Education and the Department of Health, was that they are only recommending cohort for K to six. Those are their recommendations. We already began utilizing the cohort model on January 5th, so this didn't impact us. The guidance does not recommend that the full in-person model of instruction be employed in any schools in substantial transmission in their county, bringing students back five days a week. But you'll note that's not completely what the media reported. So I wanna make sure that our constituents, our parents understand that when Dr. Levine said, we want schools to start opening to elementary. She said in a hybrid fashion, we are already in that and we hope to keep that running for as long as possible while we're in substantial. Keeping our children in the hybrid cohort model is our best chance in my opinion of keeping them in school longer while we're in substantial. It also permits us to have less quarantines which was huge in November and October. And as a result of close contact, we can keep kids spread out better and therefore we should have less quarantines. While I would like all children to be here, our teachers, our administrators want all children to be here if that is the option they choose five days a week, as long as the county is insubstantial, we will have significant quarantines because if the virus is in the community, it comes into our buildings. All we can do is try to mitigate with masking and other types of mitigations like social distancing. The next question asked um, by some of our parents, if ages 10 and below are not transmitting the virus like 11 and up, why not categorize grades five and six with our secondary schools? The data on, and my answer is, the data on ages 11 to 12 seem to also indicate a lower transmission rate, that's true, but some health experts divide this age group. For instance, our own Secretary of Health, she excluded children over the ages of 11 from testing or quarantining when traveling. But yet when we look at the recommendations for schools from PDE and PADOH, it is K to six should be in remote. So I think, you know, from what I read from the research that they are sending us, uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Education, that there's some disagreement among the research and the medical professionals about ages even 11 to 14, not just 11 to 12. The data is not clear on that age group yet. It's a little more clear on 10 and under. Question, when can we return to the five day a week model? The million dollar question. Again, when we signed that attestation form, we agreed to follow the temporary closure, the new chart. And that new chart classifies our elementary buildings in, as medium buildings and our secondary buildings, grades seven through 12, as large buildings. So I'll remind you, if you look at that chart on the PD website or on our website, 
if we have four to six cases in a 14 day rolling period in an elementary, in one of our medium sized buildings, we need to close per their recommendations for three to seven days for deep cleaning and um, contact tracing. They give us some discretion with the four to six and some discretion with the three to seven. We know we can deep clean quite quickly at Seneca Valley and we've gotten good at this because we bought the sprayers and misters back in July that uh, didn't get here until close to September, but we're able to disinfect classrooms and rooms like this quite quickly. So we know we've, we have that piece under control and our nurse administrator working with our building nurses have gotten very good at case investigations and they work very closely and quickly now with the Pennsylvania Department of Health in contact tracing. So again, I think we could do temporary closures less than three days, but I don't have that authority because of the attestation form. So we're hoping just as PDE loosened up on January 7th and saying, yes, you can bring elementary back in a cohort fashion while you're in substantial. I hope and I'm hopeful they may revise this chart again. But for now, we have to follow that chart. Data over the winter break. I think this is interesting data for the board to know about and for our public to know about. In approximately 20 weeks, the nurse administrator and I have tracked. So in 20 weeks from August 20th to December 22nd, it's about 125 days. We only had 40 staff members out of the nearly 900 report that they had contracted COVID. That's pretty good. However, I want you to consider this. Over the winter break, in only 12 days, we had 12 staff members. So again, I think it shows you, and we weren't in session. So again, I think it shows you the level of community transmission out there if you compare August to December versus now January. Will we have future long-term shutdowns where we have to go full remote for several weeks? That's a question. All future closures will be temporary and driven by the COVID cases and the new chart from PDE and PADOH until they change it again. But for now, you can find that under responding to COVID-19 cases at school, recommendations for pre-K to 12 schools following identification of cases of COVID-19. Again, that's on our COVID-19 link and it's also on PDE and PADOH websites. I want the public to also understand, I reviewed the what happens if you have four to six cases, but we should also understand what happens if we have seven or more cases, then we're looking at a 14 day closure in the medium sized buildings and 11 plus cases in the large buildings will trigger a 14 day closure. We're going to do our very best to try to avoid that type of a length of closure but if we get 11 or more cases, staff and students combined in a large building, grades seven through 12, or seven or more cases in those medium sized buildings, we're looking at a two week closure. Now they do count the weekends in that 14 day. But um, again, I tell you, if, if we can stay in cohort, the longer we can stay in cohort, I hope the better our chances are of staying open longer without temporary closures. But we do know that neighboring school districts that started before us or started last week in a five day model are already, some of them are already closing as of tomorrow for temp, a temporary closure to clean and do contact tracing. So, you know, we're keeping a close eye on these cases. We already have three staff um, cases at Hain Middle School. So, you know, that's one that we're watching very closely right now. One at CVE, a staff case, we have to pay attention to those. And uh, all I can tell you is we'll keep updating the dashboard every day and monitor these closely. But unfortunately, we're going to need you to be flexible yet again. Please don't shoot the messenger. I didn't develop the chart. None of us developed the chart about temporary closures. They are developed from the Pennsylvania Department of Health. So when you yell at me or you're upset with me, I didn't develop the chart the board didn't develop the chart, but we had to agree to follow that chart or they would have closed us and put us in full remote until further notice, which includes if the state puts you in full remote, 
it includes no sports, no extracurricular activities, no nothing. It's not just remote learning. So I wanna point that out. We are starting to get questions now about, here are some questions. If I had COVID, at what point am I required to quarantine if I'm exposed again? If I've had COVID, do I need to quarantine if I travel outside of Pennsylvania? If I've had the vaccine, do I need to quarantine? So all of these questions are starting to pour in and they are legitimate questions. And as more and more people get the vaccine, there will be more and more of these questions. We're working through these with the Pennsylvania Department of Health. As soon as we have clear answers on these, we will be posting those to our website as well. So that is the COVID-19 update for the school board. If you have questions, I will take those now. Any questions from anyone? On the screen, I'm looking, I'm not seeing anything. Um, I, I guess I, I'm going to reiterate what, what Dr. Vitella said um, numerous times, but it seems to get lost in, in our 30 second uh, uh, soundbite mentality that we had to sign the ATAT station form so that we could not only continue any in-person instruction, but also that allowed us to do all the extracurriculars. Um, if we hadn't signed that and agreed to all the rules that, you know, Dr. Vitell just spent uh, a lot of time explaining, we wouldn't be having, you know, basketball going on right now and wrestling and all those other activities. Those would have been shut down and we'd been full remote. Um, in, and it's always, you know, our goal is to get back to five person. And right now we can't do that because we're not allowed to do that with where the county is uh, on transmission. So we need to get that as a community. We need to get that down so we can get the kids back to five days, uh, full in person. Um, I think some of the other things, the quarantine issue that Dr. Vitell talked about, um, to be honest, back in November, if you remember, we had over 550 uh, students that were in quarantine, which is about 8% of our total uh, school age population. So that's the types of things that, yes, that, you know, they didn't have COVID necessarily, but they were quarantined and, and having to be remote. Um, when Dr. Vitell talked about the 25 teachers that you know we can you know supplement with uh, our super subs, and after that, you know, we can't staff properly, that's five percent of our total teaching population. So the, those types of things that that we need to do, you know, part of it is being in the in the schools, um, making sure we're keeping you know masks on and things like that. But we're not seeing the transmissions, Dr. Vitell said, from the schools. It's out in the community. We, we need the community to help us to help them. Um, and the 30 second sound bites, as Dr. Vitell said, you know, you can hear a lot of, of what's being reported as well. You know, Secretary of Health said, get the kids back to school. You're right, but we have to do it under the rules that they established and they haven't changed yet. So that's the rest of the story type part of it. Um, I, I think that, you know, our staff, our administration has done an amazing job of making sure that, you know, the students are safe, the staff is safe, uh, our nurses, I mean, God bless them for what they've done. Uh, Nurse Williams for, for everything that she's had to organize, um, making sure that we had the opportunity to get our nurses vaccinated over the, the Christmas holiday. Um, she mobilized troops, got them up to get vaccinated. And, you know, they're gonna come up with their second dose here shortly. Uh, one of the things I wanted to point out, which um, I think is important to share with the, the, you know, the public is none of our nurses had any negative side effects uh, from getting the vaccine. So, you know, more and more people that, that we can trust as a community, uh, we're seeing the successes of the vaccine. Um, don't be scared. You know, we're doing it, what we can to, to make sure that back to, you know, we want the world to look like what it did back in February of 2020. And we need the community's help to do that from a school setting and, you know, it's a community in general. So with all that said, uh, there's no other questions or comments, uh, Mr. Peterson. Just a comment, Mr. President. Um, it was just about this time last year in Wuhan, China, that a uh, physician scientist identified a novel virus. It was making people sick, didn't understand it. Um, so we've got just about a year with this virus. Whenever a new or novel virus uh, outbreak occurs, the, among the first things the medical scientists try to understand are pathogenicity and transmissibility. So how sick does it make people? 
and how quickly does it move through the population? A year later, we still can't understand why in pathogenicity, some people test positive and have no signs or symptoms and others become mortally ill. We're finding um, that there are uh, 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 variations evolving of this virus that make it more transmissible that for reasons no one really understands. The great hope is that the, the vaccine that's being used is going to um, mitigate the infections from these new strains. So I, I applaud the administration for looking, uh, for being having their decisions driven by data. Biostatisticians talk about the tyranny of small numbers and indeed we do have small numbers, but they're the best numbers we have. And uh, comparing those with what the state's reporting and, and the federal government's just overwhelming. There's just so many cases now. It's hard to keep up, it's, it changes every day. But um, I think that one of the things to take away from all this is that we have to be quick on our feet. We have to be able to pivot. That's a word we've used an awful lot lately. And um, to that extent, I'd like to suggest, if I may, that during this week, um, there be drafted a letter of thanks to the Butler Health System for all of their uh, support that they've given us and information and getting our nurses and that we bring that to the agenda next week to be, be reviewed and hopefully passed by the entire board. Excellent idea. Um, Dr. Raquel, if I could task you with that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Any other questions, comments? Hearing none. Dr. Vitel, thank you, as always, for uh, an informative report. We'll move on in our agenda to the next item, which is the action that we're going to take next week. And the first of it will be to approve the minutes of our meetings from our reorganization meeting of December 7th, 2020, and our action meeting of December 7th, 2020. The treasurer's report, which is included in your backup. The general fund bills, we'll look to approve those in a grand total amount of $6,316,482.95 and construction fund bills in the total of $5,590,141.23. And those are in your backup as well. And again, if you have any questions on any of those items, please get with Ms. Bertner this week. We'll move on to administration action. Uh, next week, we're gonna be looking to approve the following, the board policies uh, that are in your backup. Policy number 212, reporting student progress revised first reading. Policy 217, graduation requirement, revised first reading. Policy 218.4, discipline of student convicted or adjudicated of sexual assault, revised first reading. School bus drivers to approve the list of new bus drivers since September 21st, 2020 for ABC Transit and Valley Lines, and that's in your backup. And finally, the revised phase school reopening health and safety plan uh, that's provided in your backup. Are there any questions or comments on any of those items? Um, on the screen, not seeing any. So we'll move on uh, to instruction action. Uh, Ms. Harrison. Yes, next week we'll um, vote on the following instruction action. It would be to improve the co conferences requested and provided in the backup. Thank you, Ms. Harrison. Are there any questions, comments? Mr. Whittison? No. Okay. Uh, seeing no questions or comments, we'll move on to business and finance. Mr. Jacobs. Thank you. Six items for approval next week. The first is the Votech, Votech Authority bond refinancing. Approve resolution A and resolution B regarding an agreement between the Butler County Area Botechnical, Vocational Technical School, excuse me, and the Butler County Area Vocational Technical Authority regarding a proposed bond refinancing project that's included in the backup and the item I referenced earlier. The second is the ABC Transit Agreement Addendum. Approve the ABC Transit Agreement Addendum. Third is Valley Lines Incorporated Agreement Addendum. Approve the Valley Lines Incorporated Agreement Addendum. Change orders approve the construction change orders for the new K to six elementary school at Ermine Road. Fifth item 
is the adoption of a budget resolution. Approve the budget resolution indicating that the district will not raise the tax rate for, for any tax for the support of its public schools for the 2021-2022 fiscal year by more than 3%, which is the Act 1 index for the district as established by the Department of Education. And the last item, as we heard about earlier, is the bond issue resolution authorized the incurring of non-electoral debt by the issuance of general obligation bonds series of 2021 in an aggregate principal amount not to exceed $27,975,000. Is covenanting to pay and pledging all available taxing power of the local government unit for the payment of the, of the bonds, establishing a sinking fund and appointing a sinking fund depository fixing the form, maximum interest rates, maturity, redemption, and other provisions for the bond, for the payment thereof, authorizing the acceptance of a proposal for purchase of the bonds, authorizing a filing of the required documents with the Department of Community and Economic Development, ratifying and directing certain actions of officers and making certain other co covenants and provisions in respect of the bonds, which is also included in the backup. Thank you, Mr. Jacobs. Sorry about that, folks. A little loud. Uh, are there any questions or comments on any of the uh, business and finance action items? Nothing on the screen and nothing here. I would ask uh, Mr. Whittison to take the next item of personnel. Thank you, Mr. Tulio. At our next meeting under personnel, I'll be looking to make a motion to approve the resignations, appointments, leaves, the financial incentive program for professional substitutes, and the memorandum of understanding. Thank you, Mr. Whittison. Uh, those items have been discussed in executive session. Um, so we'll move on to the communications that we received. We received over 20 pieces of communication since our last meeting. Again, this is something that uh, this board has you know, made sure that we have shared and uh, discussed and read all of these. Uh, so please keep communicating with us. We will read them and we will respond. That brings us to uh, the final item on our agenda uh, prior to adjournment, which is a public comment. And we do have one person signed up for uh, public comment, and that is uh, Tyler Bintram. And Tyler, I'm pretty sure you live in Lancaster Township. Yes, sir. So I'd be your school board rep. I just want to fill it in on the form. Oh, okay. um, so the way this works is uh, we give you four minutes uh, to speak, um, to say whatever you want. Uh, what I'll do is I'll keep track of it, just give you a little, you know, probably tap of the gavel or some indication when you get close, just so you know to wrap it up. We're not going to cut you off at four minutes, you know, but, you know, try to stay within, you know, that area. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this is not the turnout that I expected tonight, so I just assumed I'd have all 30 minutes. But, <laughs> um, no, uh, you know, I, I just want to start off by saying, you know, happy, happy New Year to everyone. Um, my name is Ty Bentram. I do live in Lancaster Township. Uh, I have two, two uh, children in the school district, and uh, I'm suggesting, I guess, to the board a new way of thinking in the new year. Uh, thinking and dealing with COVID, um, I've had some discussions with Dr. Vitali, and I, you know, I realize what uh, you guys are up against. Um, but I also think at this point, uh, in the in on the calendar, I mean, we've all known someone who's had COVID, or you know, uh, hopefully has survived. So I think we have a better idea of what we're dealing with. Um, I'm not suggesting that COVID is over. Obviously, it's not. Um, but I am suggesting that the holidays are over for the most part, uh, which was sort of an understanding that I reached as for, you know, why uh, some of this remote learning and cohort was necessary, just the uncertainty of what students were going to do, um, you know, over the holidays, who they're going to mingle with. Um, so I would, uh, I would like to suggest that the focus be obviously on in-person schooling uh, five days a week. Dr. Patel mentioned about, um, you know, just the different places that the kids have to go when they're in these cohort models. Five days a week would keep them with the same group for the most part. 
Um, they may not have to go to their caregiver or their relative or, or neighbor's house for something like that. Um, as I mentioned, I have two children in the school district. Uh, they're both elementary school students. I have a second grader and a kindergartner. And uh, I feel like this remote is doing them a huge disservice. Um, you know, I certainly think that everyone's doing what they can and, you know, they've been trying to do that for a long time, but, uh, you know, the proof I think is in the pudding. We, uh, we talked a little about my, uh, son's Ames web tests and, uh, on the results, you know, the descriptors of well below average and less than 50% chance of achieving springtime goals that, that just doesn't seem like you know, he's, he's uh, getting a whole lot uh, in this situation during the pandemic. Uh, my wife and I are lucky. We have jobs that allow us to work at home so we can serve as the, the moderator, I guess, between the uh, lesson plans and between the teacher. Um, I don't begin to understand how parents who have to go to work, um, you know, are, are doing anything remotely uh, that's helping their young students uh, it, it could be different for the older students. I do believe that they might be fairly successful at this. Um, I will say uh, there's a fair amount of cohort confusion in our household. Our kids don't know, you know, when they're going to school. Uh, you know, I, I, I give uh, your staff and, and teachers, bus drivers, a lot of credit. I don't know how they keep the day straight. Um, we struggle with that at my house. And... Uh, you know, with, with regards to the staff, I think that obviously uh, you need to get the teachers vaccinated. I kind of look at them as like second responders to this pandemic. So, um, you know, anything that can, can be done to get them vaccinated and make them feel safer and better. Um, I've, uh, I've heard of other counties where they're, they're actually like administrative staff was getting it. So like more than just the nurses. So. I'm hopeful that that can start happening to make teachers feel safer. Um, and I do believe that they are doing the best job that they can. I'm, I'm not here to complain about the teachers. Um, I guess one of my fears is that, you know, parents are going to start to become somewhat complacent. You know, this is the new normal. This is, this is what it is. Um, for elementary school students, this is not normal. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess I'd just like to look forward to 2020, 2021 and, you know, see that as a year of back to school and, you know, parents getting back to work. And um, I think that would all be really good things. So uh, I guess in closing, uh, I would just say, you know, parents, I think, uh, have to assume risk. I think that there are the option of keeping your kid in, in a remote learning environment if the parent decides to, to do that the parents that want to send their kids to school, I, I believe that the parent takes that risk and, and liability. And, um, you know, I guess I would just like to suggest for the next several months, um, you know, parents I think need to keep their kids away from the susceptible, away from, you know, the, the people that may have pre-existing conditions, the elderly, grandma and grandpa, please don't keep them away from their teachers any longer than they have to be. Keep them away from the people that they need to not be around until, you know, we can really, uh, really turn around on this uh, pandemic. So, uh, you know, as I've said before, I really do believe there's worse things than COVID. And if this continues, I think it's really going to come into focus with, with the young students, you know, just, just how bad off uh, their, their education has suffered. And, um, I'm hopeful. So thank you very much for the time and uh, have a good evening. Thank you, Mr. Bentram, and thank you for, for staying for the whole meeting. Uh, we do like hearing from folks. So anytime you want to come, you're more than invited. Thank you. Thank you. With that, if there is no other business to be brought before the board, I would look for a motion to adjourn our meeting. So moved. I will give the movement to uh, Ms. Harrison. She raised her hand first and uh, Mr. Second. Peterson, I'll give you the second. 
All right, we have a, a motion and a second. So all those in favor of adjournment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. We are adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for joining us.